I think that is one of the uh, quickest intros I've ever done because it's just like it's super precise. It's like this is what the show is. Boom. And I am your host, Tom or Robots. So welcome to the show. And I'm here with my good buddy, Toasty. Toasty, how's it going? I feel like we haven't talked in ages. Yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> yeah, it's been a while. Like all of like uh, it's been a, a total mm, of 72 hours, 72 and, hours. Yeah, since we talked in video form for podcasting and even less than that, if you count uh, discussions online and in chats and stuff from other shows and, and all of that stuff where I accidentally called Captain Logan Toasty because because I was reading your freaky because you were posting so much stuff during the cyberpunk lorecast. But anyway, You're welcome. You, you had some really good you had some really good insights in that. So I, I can't complain. Um, but welcome back, everybody. This is the Witcher Lorecast. I hope you have been enjoying our episodes. Last time we left off on the discussion about Witchers with uh, some info about the creation of the Witchers. And we've got some more to dig into this week about that same topic. Is that right, Toasty? That's where we're going. Well, specifically, we're going to talk about how one makes a witcher. How does how does one go through? What is the recipe for a witcher? Yes. And then talking about uh, particular skills and abilities that they have. Cool. Cool. All right. Well, let's let's dig into that. So um, I've got my I've got my big old cauldron here and I've got all these assorted uh, funny looking, you know, alchemical ingredients. And I've got the water boiling. What is the first ingredient I put into the Witcher porridge? How does this how does this work? Well, we haven't gotten to the porridge yet. Oh, we okay, can't, okay. We can't consume the delightful porridge yet. I'm jumping the uh, gun. All right. So where do we start? So we start with a choice. It's, I was actually surprised to, to find out about this. I didn't know this was a thing. Uh, in order to become a Witcher, the initiate must first choose that it's time for them to proceed into the process. So it all begins with the choice of a potential initiate made the voluntary decision. I worded that terribly (laughs) to follow the special witcher diet consisting of mushrooms, mosses, and herbs and grueling physical training. During this period, young adepts were taught sword skill, monster lore, herbalism, and rudimentary spells called signs. All of those things seem necessary when you're talking about like monster fighting wizard warriors, right? Like that, like that leads off from last time, right? This idea was we were going to create these super soldiers who could use magic in order to fight off the monsters. That was their goal, right? Right. So this idea of them being able to understand all of these things seems like a nece- necessary for that to be achieved. Now, we know that, of course, they didn't reach the same magical abilities as were hoped, but the rest of that stuff still seems very crucial. Right. Well, it, it, it all starts with the trials, and I'm sure a lot of people in the Witcher community have heard about the trials. And probably the one they're most familiar with is this first one, the trial of the grasses. So this is the first trial. It was a week long procedure and required the absorption of special virus cultures plus alchemical ingredients known as the grasses to modify the physiology of the subject. The grasses included corn lily, nightshade, spear grass, wild rye and wolf spain. Furthermore, mutagenic elixirs were essential as well. Supposedly, albumin, egg white, of <laughs> or the egg white of uh-huh. gray. This is a great word. Scalapendromorphs. Scalapendromorphs. Giant, That's such a good giant word. Centipedes. Yes. Constituted the basis of witcher mutagens. So, so they took the egg white from giant centipede eggs as the base. For these mutagens i love that that's super creepy <laughs> i wonder how big these centipedes are uh, they're pretty big yeah. uh pretty massive um <laughs> what, what? <laughs> i'm just trying to think about that like just think about a witcher who's like ah oh, it's it's time for the 
the the annual trial of the grasses. They gotta go on some giant centipedes so I can get their eggs. Right, right, right. <laughs> who's who's gonna go get the centipede eggs? Uh, not, not it. it, not it, not it. All right, all right. Paper, rock, scissors. Here we go. <laughs> like, Gary, it's your turn to get the centipede eggs. Oh, I did it last time. You you lost, Gary. You, that's just how the rules work. Yeah. And before the main portion of the trial began, uh, a segment of the grasses were served to the children via teas. So like before they even got into the laboratory to absorb all these cultures and things, they were served teas with all these different ingredients in them. Mm. So for the actual laboratory procedure, and this is going to get a, a little uh, uncomfortable, okay. maybe for, for some, some people, uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, so the herbs and elixirs were injected directly into the immobilized child's veins. Yes. Um, so a reminder from last time, because it's been two weeks since we talked about this stuff. If you aren't into uh, the children going through uh, what might feel like <laughs> terrible things and potentially dying, and some of them did, then um, definitely skip this stuff. Uh, because this, uh, <laughs> this gets pretty dark. Yeah, I, I really, I really hope that no one's into this. <laughs> yeah, no. Well, not <laughs> in like you, if, please right, right. No, it, should, it should bother you, but if it bothers you uh, to an extreme amount, where you you definitely shouldn't be listening to the episode, then skip it. Yeah, I hope it bothers everybody. Like, yeah, hopefully, I, I none of us really are psychopaths so. with no uh, no ability to you know <laughs> empathize. But yeah, go. Um, so okay, so these herbs and elixirs were uh, injected directly. So intravenously into quote immobilized children's veins got it yeah so most adepts died by the third day uh there's and not a lot of people survived this so this would be considered poisonous probably to most people then even potentially adults yes yeah, so it, this would be pretty much poison to everyone i believe that the the first segment of like the 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 change in the diet and like how much like training because they do a lot of physical training before they get to this part mm -hmm. so they their their bodies are becoming like peak physical condition as well as like the mushrooms mosses and herbs adding that uh i guess a, that that physiology change a little bit to like prepare them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for this but even then it's still <laughs> A lot, not a lot survived. So the survivors agitated by strikes of sudden madness would fall into a deep stupor, their eyes turning glassy, hands reaching for any nearby clothing and breath loud and hoarse. After being administered the elixirs again, the children's cough would progress into vomiting. They would also suffer from seizures while cold sweat ran down their skin. Thus weakened, the adepts fought with the mutagens, herbs, and viruses when they woke up by the seventh day, their eyes had already turned cat-like. No more than three, or at best four in ten, survived. The rest died in agony. Aside from the eyes, the trial granted witcher adepts lightning-quick reflexes, slower aging, physical strength, as well as sharpened senses. Yeah, this seems like a, um, I don't know, it's a similar, I guess, to fighting off a disease. I mean, it's it, viruses are included in this, right? But the idea yes. is to create a very significant change to the DNA of the, the person that you're administering this to. Um, and I, I think that's, that's a really interesting thing that, and this is, uh, this I find interesting about the lore of the Witcher is that we don't get much talk about things like DNA in most fantasy because the concept of DNA is a more recent scientific discovery. But in the world of the Witcher, they seem to have an understanding of this. They seem to have a sense of like, there's something that these things do that biologically change you on a fundamental level enough to even change the way your eyes look. And they, they it's like forced mutation. Yeah, it, it's it's kind of crazy because like they talk about magic and things, of course, we know magic's a part of it. Mm -hmm. But if you there's parts of the books where you hear or you listen to like wizards consult or sorcerers, sorceresses like consulting with each other. And it's really like scientific conversation, like their science is included in like the magic process. 
Right. Which makes a lot of sense because science is fundamentally a process of verification. That's really what it is. It's a here's a here's a theory or here's a hypothesis. Let's remove all the variables except for one. Test that one variable to see if that actually has an effect on the result. And then let's do it again and let's do it again. And if it does, then we've confirmed something. If it doesn't, we need to test a different variable and you move forward. Right. So it would make sense for somebody who is studying magics if you were going to have a sense of really how to do magic or what ingredients were needed in something, how things actually worked, then a scientific process for understanding that would lead you eventually to the truth of the situation, right? Like it makes sense that these intelligent, learned people would be talking in ways that were actually scientific. And this comes back to whenever we talk about how Cosimo Malaspina and Alzor were first initially doing this. Just think how many different procedures. I mean, they had to verify each different like virus that they could use the right herbs, right. Levels of that. Like can't even imagine how long that must've taken. Yeah. It's, it's a, uh, it's similar to some of the testing and things that like the Nazis did to people in world war II. Um, some of their agenda was actually to, uh, <laughs> remove certain things from the human uh, genome and reduce the ability for people to get sick and those kinds of things. Um, but in order to test those things, they had to do it on unwilling uh, individuals, which seems very kind of similar to this methodology. So after the trial of the grasses, we have the trial of dreams uh, consisting of a series of psychedelic visions induced by druids or mages. This process further enhanced the abilities, specifically night vision. This was also the procedure that sterilized the adepts. Interesting. Yeah. I, I, I always kind of assumed that the, the change in the eyes had something to do with the night vision, but it's actually this part of it. Well, so they have it from the, like the change in the eyes a little bit, but this just further, further improved. Like they already have all these, then the trial of dreams just makes them better. Mm. Mm. So, okay. Uh, then after that, and these are a selection of some that are a little bit different to uh, different schools. Uh, we have the trial of the mountains or to the wolf school, which is as the trial of the medallion, uh, which served as an exam intended to verify what the adepts remembered from the previous stages of training would be wolves needed to swim across a pond near Kermoran, get through caverns inhabited by an old cyclops called Old Spear Tip <laughs> without waking him up, then climb Troll's Head, deal with its mistrustful rock trolls, and get to a circle of elements. After activating their medallion at the circle, the trial was complete. All this was done in groups as mentors believed that even though witchers were lone hunters, they could still benefit from cooperation. That makes sense. That sounds very school of the wolf. In fact, the symbology of the wolf would make sense for that, right? Like wolves are pack hunters, um, whereas things like bears are solo hunters. Um, so it would make sense that like you you need to be strong enough to survive on your own. But if you do have help from others, then don't go without it because you're more likely to succeed. Um, also, I love the idea of old Cyclops. Uh, the old Cyclops named Old Spear Tip. I, I like to think that the uh, the older witchers probably have a relationship with him. And they're like, hey, buddy, we're going to do another one of our trials. Can you, uh, you make sure you're asleep <laughs> for the kids to run through here? Okay. <laughs> try, not to, try not to murder too many of them. All right. Because <laughs> we don't we don't we fight this guy in, in Witcher 3? Do we? It's been a while. I know that you do a number of things around Kaer Morin. I believe that you fight him. I'm not sure if you kill him. Hmm. That's a good question. Yeah, I don't recall specifically. But, uh... Okay. Yeah. Well, here, why don't I look it up and you, you keep going? I was like got, looking for it. I was yeah. like, wow. Well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it says that you fight him with uh, Lambert. <laughs> Okay, he is one of the ones that you fight. Okay, that's yeah. cool. Uh, yeah, so old this, spear tip. There he is. This trial differs for the uh, School of the Bear, uh, which they had a more ruthless version, which the goal was to reach the summit 
of formidable Mount Gorgon and retrieve a special runestone as a token of their ascent. Many froze to death before ever finding the summit, their frozen bodies left in the snow to mark the way. Hmm. So uh, I'm assuming Mount Gorgon here is a uh, significantly taller mountain. Uh, and, you know, you get to that certain point where you just like, it's so cold that you can't really do anything. And I'm sure they weren't allowed to like wear too much in the way of protective clothing. It's like, ah, go do it. If you can't do it like this, then you don't deserve to be a witcher, I guess. I think it's interesting that both of these, although they're similar, uh, in some ways and different in others, they both have references to Greek mythology. You've got the Cyclops and then the Gorgon and the Gorgon being uh, most likely, you know, uh, like a Medusa, like a snake headed creature. And then another trial we have is the trial of the sword. And this is optional. And this was sometimes used when a witcher master was unsure of the candidate. It was uh, consisted of a ritual sword duel. So if, if, one of the uh, elder witchers wasn't completely certain that this person was ready. They would then challenge them to a sword duel and see if they were able to, uh, I guess, either hold their own or even win in order to determine if they were ready. Yeah. I would imagine most at best would hold their own against a, a well-trained master witcher, you know, uh, because they're still ch children in training. Um, I wonder if this is the kind of thing where if they don't seem particularly adept at some of the other stuff that they've survived, then the idea is as long as they're good enough with a sword that can help make up for it. Yeah, I mean, which is most important tools are their, their swords. swords, right? So. Right. So like maybe maybe some of these other things didn't take so so as strong as some of the other students, but ultimately if they're good enough with a sword, okay, they're good. Mm -hmm. So we have some school specific trials next, uh, the trial of the forest eyes. Uh, and this was specific to the school of the wolf. Uh, at times when the witchers found themselves outside of the Morhen Valley, the trial of the forest eyes was used as the final exam. Instead during the trial, adepts were taken out into the woods, blindfolded and tied up. They thus had to completely rely on senses other than sight to pass. They were to return back to their instructors. They, uh, until the next morning, <laughs> they, uh -huh. they weren't. Um, if they were late, they failed the trial. And if they were caught cheating, an instructor hung them by their feet for one night as punishment. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's, uh, cheap. <laughs> that's that's pretty rough sounding. Um, but yeah, I, I guess this uh, mimics potentially some of the dangerous kinds of situations they're going to be in. And it's not the most dangerous situation they could possibly be in. But hey, we're going to tie you up, leave you in the forest. Let's see if you survive, because guess what? The world's going to do things like that to you. So let's let's see how you do. And I wonder if this kind of shows um, the like desperation because the school of the wolf was basically the last school to be made, like from the remnants of who was left from the order of witchers. And it like, you would think that in something this important that if you cheated, they would just fail it. Like you would, you would be done. Mm -hmm. But whatever that means, I don't know if they would like kill you or whatever, but here they have a punishment. It, it like, but it doesn't say that you automatically fail and you can't do it again. Like, right. So it kind of shows like that desperation at that point of uh, we need witchers. We kind of have to, I don't know, like give them extra chances here. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, if they can survive another night hanging from their feet in the woods, then maybe that shows that they're ultimately still good enough to make it. <laughs> so for the school of the Griffin, uh, when the adepts of care, Saren, reached their final trial, they were presented with a choice. Uh -huh. <laughs> they either completely recited L Liber Tenebrarum, I probably didn't say that right, by Sylvester Bugiardo, or went out to find and fetch an egg from a griffin nest. Not one trainee has ever chosen the recitation. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Nobody was wants to, to recite you know text they, they're just like all right i guess i'll go get a griffin egg i wonder if they have to memorize it and it's like super long and daunting or something 
I assume I assume so, but it's still like I mean, would it would it not be easier to just put in the time to remember this this text rather than like because like fighting griffins that, that that's no small thing like that's that's one of the bigger monsters like <laughs> the, the the Liber Tenebrarum is also uh, known by the name the Book of Fell, but authentic cases never explained by science. <laughs> this is great. Huh. Is, it, is it ridiculously long? Um, I, I don't, I'm looking up in details on it. Uh, I don't, I can't find an actual writing about it. There's really not a whole lot available, but that's great. That's, <laughs> yeah. Well, I'd rather just go get a, go get a Griffin egg. I mean, I guess at that point they, they feel pretty strong about their physical abilities and they've gone through a lot that they're just like, yeah, that sounds easier than having to recite this big, long, terrible work <laughs> of writing. I wonder how many of them were just, um, uh, couldn't read also or read well enough that that sounded just really difficult. I think, I think that was kind of part of the, the Witcher training. I mean, you have to learn like monster lore. Yeah. And as we saw in Witcher three, she's learning like series learning about ghouls and owl ghouls from like books. So That's true. I think they probably like taught them to read because most of the time these initiates are pretty young whenever they brought them into the fold. So That's true. That's true. But it may also have just lots of terrible big words that are hard. You know, you know, kids are like that, like, like uh, you know, a seven. A, yeah, yeah, yeah. An eight year olds like it can read most of the things that are like at their level. But if you give them something from, you know, an adult's book, you know, and they're just like, ah, oh, these words, uh, <laughs> they don't want to do it. Words are hard. Words are hard. <laughs> yeah. uh, so this next trial is specific to the school of the cat, which places emphasis on agility and flexibility. So the cats had a final trial which was reached by gradually walking higher and higher on a tightrope. Meant first and foremost to develop balance in young adepts, the failure wasn't too dangerous at first. Falling off during the final tri trial, however, equaled death. Hmm. And this, so, this makes sense for the school of the cat, too, you would think. Like a cat, agility, the ability to walk on things up high. And, and from the sounds of this, it seems like this was a... Uh, a like certain like you took this trial at certain levels mm -hmm. as opposed to uh like at the end because it said at first it, in uh that it wasn't too dangerous so I, I suppose maybe like they did the trial of the grasses and then this in which like they w walked up the tightrope but it wasn't too bad and then eventually like later on there was just now you got to go all the way to the top yeah yeah that makes sense. So it's it is interesting to me. This is the last of the uh, uh, school specific trials, but it's interesting to me here how each of them really does, in some ways, mirror the the name of the school, um, which probably also reflects some of the things that they uh, symbolically value more. You know, like cooperation with the school of the wolf, or this uh, you know balance and and those kinds of things with the school of the cat, and. Um, and I think this is also interesting because if you're diving back into the games or the show, who knows what other witchers we're going to meet in the show beyond just any of the school of the wolf, you know, whether that's this season or next or whenever, or in the other show that they're going to do that's before the current uh, time with Geralt. Like, keep these things in mind that some of these other witchers from different schools may be more adept at certain types of things. If we, if you played The Witcher Three, you kind of get a uh, knowledge on this as well. Like whenever it comes to crafting the different Witcher armors, and you kind of build out, and they have effects, you know, depending on what that school's normally good at. So, like School of the Cat is all about like being agile and quick and fast, whereas the School of the Griffin is focused on boosting magic. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's funny because that feels like a video game thing, like something they might have just added for the game, but it is something that's actually part of the lore before the games. So it wasn't just a an accommodation for you know gear in a video game, which is really cool. The fact that it, it actually connects back to a, a real thing from the books, because the books were the original source for the material, if anybody is still confused about that. Um, so that is really cool. Well, what do you say we go to the mid break and then we come back later and we talk about some of the genetic side of the, the witchers, the advantages and the disadvantages. How's that sound? Sounds fun. 
Very well. Let us get this over with. Something has infested my vineyard. Mm-hmm. Great. Let me go prepare my something oil then. All right, here we are in the middle of the show, and thank you to everybody who is tuning in, and especially if you are somebody who has listened to one of the other shows on the network, one of the other Robots Radio shows, one of my other Lorecast shows, welcome to the show. I'm glad you guys are here. I hope you guys are enjoying it. There is so much to get into with The Witcher, and we have only barely, barely touched the surface of of these stories and games, so... Um, looking forward to digging into that stuff with you guys. Also, uh, this show is only going to be as successful as y- y- we are able to get you to interact with us and help out the show. I mean, this is really just like a, a project for us to work on. But in order for this to continue growing an audience, helping us out by telling your friends or leaving a rating and review is extremely extremely helpful and toasty we got another new review this week and uh oh, is this one of those international ones that i can't see <laughs> uh potentially um so so here here we go uh no well yeah there's there's oh no we, we talked about these ah man we did the other show so recently that i thought we had a new one let me just double check while i'm while i'm gabbing on here because i feel like i, I might have a seen little one. bit ago but uh, there was the same three i could see but you can see like yeah the other countries and stuff yeah it's uh, these other tools that you use as a podcaster i feel like we saw some other reviews come in but um i'm almost there but thank you to anyone who takes the time to leave a rating or review nope it's still the same ones um also you know what's really cool about about this other uh website that i use for finding this stuff is that we can see our ratings um and we've been up in the top 200 video game podcasts recently and we mentioned this a little bit last time we're currently down to about 225 so it fluctuates depending on the day and who listens to certain episodes on each day and and there's always like a lag of a day in reporting so sundays aren't big podcast listening days because people aren't driving to work and stuff but thank you for tuning in all of this stuff is possible because of you guys so we really really do appreciate it also we do stream this show live on twitch.tv slash robots radio on nine or at 9 p.m eastern on mondays and also that would be 6 p.m pacific and we'd love to have you join in there are some of you guys currently in chat so hello to chat but we'd love to have more and more people join us live to be part of the conversation especially as we get deeper and deeper into the lore and the things that we play through in the games i would love doing these shows and seeing people respond in chat so if we could get more of you guys to show up live that would be amazing so thank you to everybody for tuning in and thank you for your help supporting the show also toasty we've got kind of a big thing coming up this week yeah so wednesday i believe today's the 19th right yeah wednesday they're gonna release uh the witcher monster slayer the the mobile game yeah yeah the mobile game will be coming out on Wednesday and I would love I'm going to be downloading it. Toasty's going to be downloading. I already have it like, you know, pre registered, registered. So it'll just show up Same. when it's ready. Um, but man, we would love to have some of your your thoughts and, and experiences with that so that we can share them on future episodes. Um, and also in chat, uh, Soviet Panther asks, how do you leave a review? Do you have to have Apple? All you have to have is an Apple account. So you can log into the website, make sure that you just create an account or log in. You don't have to listen to podcasts on the Apple podcast player. You just need an account and then you can just log in and leave a review on there. You just search Witcher Lorecast. It'll come right up. So uh, good question. Good question. All right. Well, let's move on with the rest of the show because we've got more to talk about with Witchers. You smell of death and destiny, heroics and heartbreak. It's on you now. Right. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about the genetic advantages slash disadvantages. And I guess some of that stuff is circumstantial uh, about being a witcher. So where do we start with this? So if uh, if you wouldn't mind, Tom, I'm, I'm going to make you do things. Uh, I got a little picture, which mm-hmm. is just kind of a, a look yeah. at the uh, form it's just uh, i think it's just Geralt, but it kind of shows us a little bit of like how they uh they look yeah um, i've got a handsome half naked dude up on the screen right now you're welcome <laughs> <laughs> yeah, i'm gonna pat his uh, head hi there Geralt. this looks really weird when i'm not looking at the stream <laughs> i just see you patting random things over here <laughs> so uh well one of the things we talked about earlier already is sterility 
so during the the trials the witcher becomes sterile and they can no longer breed and pass on their traits Mm -hmm. which i'm not entirely sure because i don't know what that would cause right like how would that work for breeding anyways yeah I know- well i guess if they are genetically mutated then there is a potential if they were not sterile that they could pass that on to their children so for example yeah. the changes in their eyes or even the changes in their biology that makes them uh less susceptible to poison or uh able to live longer those things could be passed on to their children and if you had a bunch of witchers out there just making babies everywhere then you would end up with this sort of semi superhuman race walking around the world well speaking of making a bunch of babies another part of the, <laughs> that resulted from the mutations was an overdeveloped libido ah. um which caused many rumors to spring up about them so you know it's a bunch of weird looking dudes in there hitting on the ladies out there yeah, yeah doing doing a lot um so yeah your superhuman race would be pretty quick with how much they uh i guess they get around (laughs) yeah yeah that um that could i mean you look at something like uh the marvel comics and the x-men this would be something similar to that this other race of people who were considered mutants but it was genetically passed on to their children potentially and you wouldn't necessarily know right away maybe because of the eyes you would know but uh, yeah i can't imagine that would be something that they would want to get out into the world it could be very disruptive to the general population because normally when a species mutates it like it's because it better suits their environment or survivability right and then it gets starts getting passed on more because the ones who die are the ones that don't have these mutations and I mean, they already have a ton of mutations that make them more, I guess, sturdy in many different ways. Yeah. So that would be that actually be kind of terrifying now that I'm thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And if they if if somebody was to breed these as like super soldiers <laughs> for an army, then that could be very dangerous as well. Uh, yeah, that's probably was part of it. They probably didn't want someone doing something like that. But uh, another mutation where we see, and we've talked about this a little bit too, is the cat-like eyes that grant very acute night vision. Witchers can constrict their pupils to see in blinding light or open them to see in near pitch darkness. This night vision can be further enhanced with the cat potion, but in general, it is good enough by itself to not require further enhancement. Their entire sensory system is overall enhanced, allowing them to identify the species of animal from the scent of their blood and detect nearby beings even when out of sight. So they've got like just extraordinary senses this able to hear probably better as well although that's not listed here but that's part of sensing somebody nearby you is is your auditory sense and and your sense of smell um this is why some animals like humans are very adept at sight because that has been very advantageous to us throughout our evolution but something like a dog actually has better smell and better hearing because in the wild a dog working in a pack with a bunch of other dogs can hunt down something they can't see simply by listening or smelling it. And that's part of why humans started using dogs for hunting because they, it augmented the lack of our own senses when it came to smell and hearing. And another thing to note about this is that they, they can like intentionally dilate their pupils. Yeah, that's crazy. Something. So they like they in the books, there's several instances where it talks about how Geralt like dilates his pupils so that he can see in the dark. And and he does this to like um trick his opponents because they just assume he's human if it's like really dark and they don't expect him to be able to do anything. And so he like constrict his pupils and, and to show that or or that uh he can see or if he 
he tricks his opponents in one instance where he uses the sun. Like normally you don't want to stand with mm -hmm. the sun beating at you in a sword fight, but mm -hmm. he specifically takes that spot and then dilates his pupils to where the sun doesn't bother him. And he, he probably still sees yeah, opponent. constricts his pupils. Right. Right. But and, they think and, he's going to be blinded and then he's not, which means yes. that he now has the advantage again. Yeah. And, and that's, that's like a really strong ability in my opinion, just being able to do something like that to where yeah. it doesn't really matter where you are. You can just choose to have the best possible site for that instance. Can you imagine being in a conversation with somebody who is like our people's dilate for dilate for two reasons. One due to the amount of light in a room. And usually it takes them a little while to do it. Like if you, you know, the feeling of walking into a dark room and you can't see but then if you're in the dark room for a few minutes, eventually you can see better or you walk out into a bright environment and everything's just blinding and bright. And then if you wait a few minutes, all of a sudden you can see again. Well, it takes our pupils a little while to dilate. The other reason our pupils dilate is because we are looking at something we like. When we see something we like or somebody we like, our pupils actually get bigger, which is part of why psychologically, when we look at something like uh, an animal with big pupils, we see that as being more pleasing rather than something with small pupils. That's the expression like they had beady little eyes means something with small pupils because your your pupils constrict when you see something you don't like. So we're, we're actually programmed to be more uh, to find big pupils more appealing. So you could use this also from a social advantage and like narrow and constrict your pupils. Can you imagine that to like make somebody feel off off like awkward or intimidated? Oof. And it would be subconscious, they, you know? Yeah, they can, they can already sort of do, I mean, they just naturally make people uncomfortable because of like the cat eyes. Yeah. But I yeah. guess it could just be a more intimidating thing. Like or to just them down do to it, slits. like make it big and then little and the big and then little people would be like, what is wrong with your eyes? That's, <laughs> that's weird. <laughs> be real trippy. Yeah. Yeah. But they also come with a uh, tremendous resistance to disease, which functions in most cases as complete immunity and a boosted immune system, allowing them to consume large quantities of potions that could prove easily deadly if consumed even in small amounts by a normal man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's advent advantageous to us, not just to them, to us, because we're witchers to them, uh, not just for survival, but also for the concoctions that then further increase their abilities. Yeah, and indeed, I mean, their concoctions, like it says, small amounts are usually deadly to people. Mm -hmm. um, so. uh, also, we get exceptionally increased strength, speed, reflexes, and endurance far beyond any normal or well-trained human that allows them to swiftly end fights with minimal effort and perform physical feats non-witchers couldn't hope to match. A witcher's physical skills alone are sufficient to defeat most monsters single-handedly if combined with extensive training and proper weaponry, whereas regular men could only hope to accomplish this in large groups. Witchers have also been shown to shrug off hits that would normally render normal men unconscious. Additionally, they have been known to survive the strikes of powerful monsters such as giants or other beings possessing herculean strength mm -hmm. that would otherwise kill others with a single blow this is the this is the whole thing where like in every witcher game well, and many of the stories there's a scene where like Geralt's in the bar and the local guys have a problem with the witcher in the bar and so they're going to stand up and be men and be like we don't like you here witcher get out and he's like i'm just here to drink my tea or whatever and then they're like no this is all town we don't like witches here leave now or you're going to face the consequences. And he's like, you don't want to do this. <laughs> right. And then like he kicks all their butts because it, even if they all get a hit on him, they're not going to win. <laughs> like he's going to like, you think you would think the world would know by now you don't challenge a witcher to a fight. Even if you've got a group of dudes with you, like these, these are monster killing machines. They're you, a bunch of humans are not going to do anything, especially a bunch of farmers in a little village like holy crap yeah we, we get that a lot and it's they definitely touch on that in the the books uh quite a bit where he'll be in a fight and it's just described as him just basically like dashing through enemies because he's so fast and so quick they really don't even have time to do anything at all yeah like, the only people that ever potentially have a threat are like magic or yeah, magically enhanced like 
uh, sorcerers and wizards and things mm-hmm. that boost that speed and strengthen themselves. Right. <laughs> Normally, the, it's just a bloodbath for him. For yeah. Him. <laughs> and there's always the word pirouette that that's used a lot in the books as well. The, when he gets a sword out and he does a pirouette and then like I, I know it's translated from Polish. So I have to wonder what the Polish word is that translates most likely to pirouette. But I, I find that interesting as well. Uh, more magical potential than the average human, which gives them the ability to perform simple yet incredibly versatile combat magic in the form of science. They also develop a sixth sense that allows them to feel things around them be it items of importance or people's immediate intentions. This explains their uncanny ability to track and hunt people and monsters. However, the amount of magic they possess is not as close to sorcerers and sorceresses. I like this because it expands our understanding beyond just signs, which we see in the games, right? He's, you know, like, oh, I'm going to cast the Ard sign. And he does the thing with his hand, right? And and it costs. Um, But there's kind of a inherent magical quality to them that's um i don't uh passive like a passive magical quality uh it's it's kind of like um passive perception in dungeons and dragons or something like that right he has this heightened passive ability to just read people or read a scene or sense where something is that's beyond even just smell and in hearing although he has like we mentioned before heightened those as well uh, a witcher has this like I don't know. It's it's almost like they are just like slightly more into the realm of magical being than an average human. I mean, they are. They, yeah. They, <laughs> yeah. It's in, it's in really cool. Every way, they're they're better than normal humans. Uh, and finally, we have accelerated healing, granting quick recovery from injuries. So, like super fast healing, which of, of course. They're hunting monsters. I feel like this would be something you would want. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, oh, I got gashed by this griffin's claws. Now to be bedridden for the next, like, four months while this heals not. <laughs> we don't got time for that. We got to get back on the path. Right. Now, they're not like Wolverine or something where they, like, within just a few seconds, their, their wounds just, like, seal back up. But definitely better than a regular human. And... I'm this partially affects I what or I would assume partially affects the next thing, which is an incredibly long lifespan and prolonged youth. So I imagine that accelerated healing also helps to uh, sustain their bodies past uh, their normal limits. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, because a lot of times people, well, I'm, <laughs> I guess a few different things you get diseases from just getting older. Many of the diseases that we suffer now are diseases that a lot of people in the past didn't suffer because they just didn't live that long. Um, but if you, your body naturally heals and fights off things like cancers or, um, heart disease, you know, the potential for stroke, those kinds of things, then you're not going to suffer those. So you are naturally going to live longer. But then there's the second thing of like, uh, genetically are the telomeres, the, um, the length of our DNA shortens over time. And that causes a decrease in the, um, the quality of the cells that replace the cells in our bodies so that you get like skin that looks thinner and muscles that aren't as strong and bones that are weaker and those kinds of things over time. But if again, if you're healing those things more, I don't know, consistently or, you know, better for most of your life, then that could potentially increase your lifespan as well. So it makes sense. And this is a pretty significant amount of time too so for example Vesemir is said to be at least a few centuries old that's crazy but has the appearance of a middle-aged man yeah that's crazy to think of Vesemir as being like two or three centuries hundred years old you know that's it's 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 pretty crazy I yeah. didn't you definitely don't expect him to be that old but he's wow <laughs> he's, he's like had to be probably from the the origin of the school of the wolf. He's probably there in the order of the witches before anything else. I wonder, I wonder if he was one of the like original children that that first group, um, raised. I don't think it, maybe not that old. Whenever I looked at it before, I don't think it said, and I think if we'd have known, like it would have specifically told us Hmm. like that Vesemir was part of that first group, but maybe maybe second or third. 
Yeah, the sub, sub, subsequent. Gosh, I'm trying to say words and I'm yeah. failing. I'm sorry. Whenever you podcast, <laughs> words get harder. It's just, that's just the way it works. I believe it. I've been reading slow. I'm just like, wait a second. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so what about the equipment and the other skills that they have? Yeah. So, so none of these abilities would be any useful if they didn't have the right tools to uh, fully like manifest those, those abilities. Uh, so they cover proficiency in basically any weapon that comes to hand, but their primary focus is the steel sword and the silver sword. And if you've seen or delved into the Witcher at all in any way, you would know this. Those are the, the Witcher's most important tools. Yeah, look at this idiot. What's he doing with two swords? Yeah, that like people even make fun of them because they don't understand. You know what I think is interesting about this is steel swords, when made properly, can be very strong and very durable and pliable and can survive a lot of use. Um, a silver sword, I would imagine, is a lot more fragile. And yet, you know, like in a lot of stories, silver is something that, you know, you can kill a, a werewolf with or those kinds of things. So I, I wonder if and I haven't looked into this very much if those swords are actually steel cores with silver um, on the outsides, silver plated. I'd have to double check to be a hundred percent sure, but I believe that there's, there was, uh, they talk about how it's a, like, it's not completely silver, but it's like silver. I'm not, I don't want to say line. That doesn't sound quite right, mm -hmm. but like it, it's it's composite i guess yeah so it's like silver probably wrapped around yeah like you said like a steel or, core right to where it's still Plated. durable enough but even then they still i mean in in the books Geralt doesn't even wear his his swords right. like on a, well he has his steel sword on his back but for his silver sword he keeps it like wrapped up in a bundle on roach and he only like takes it out whenever he's hunting something or right. knows he's going to be fighting something. So he swaps out his swords. So he takes very careful care of it, like super careful care. Um, yeah, it makes sense because chances are, if you're just traveling or, or visiting a local village, because in the world of the monsters at this point, the in the world of the Witcher, the monsters at this point aren't as prolific anyway. So he's much more likely to be accosted by bandits on the road than he is ghouls. And these swords are typically carried on the back, like like I said, um, whether it's simultaneously like in The Witcher 3. And I think that's just a game mechanic choice that they made because, I mean, having to swap out between like silver and steel every time you get into a fight, whether it's like someone like, a you know, fighting wolves or people as opposed to monsters, mm -hmm. I'm sure that's not convenient. So just having it at the same time. Um, uh, the steel blade is for more mundane beings, while a silver blade is for beasts of the supernatural. Right, right. And uh, Lupus Malum, Malum's in chat um, and says the Witcher's blade actually has a the silver blade actually does have a steel core plated with thick layers of silver. OK, so I was right. I was right about that. Look at that. I could have written the story. Uh, that's not true. That's, I'm not that good of an author. <laughs> Uh, after the swords, witchers also frequently make use of strong potions, though only a limited amount at a time due to their toxicity. Mm -hmm. Even the weakest brews are fatal to ordinary humans. And right. we see this uh, well done in, in the Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, where you have your toxicity level and you can only really use so many at a time before you start to get like negatively impacted or losing health yeah you get all the um, veins in your face and you start looking really messed up which is always weird when you just get out of the battle where you got all the veins in your face and then you go into a cutscene and you're talking to somebody and you're like yeah it's no problem blah, blah, blah. you're just like <laughs> you look like you're just like almost dead i mean it makes sense you gotta wait for the the potions to to wear down like yeah the toxicity to go away yeah and you, sometimes you just gotta talk to someone but it's funny that like that's just part of it and people don't freak out because i think if somebody walked up to me looking like that i'd be like oh hell no <laughs> no <laughs> no no <laughs> yeah are you okay buddy yeah all right so what so, other what other kinds of equipment do they usually have well they're trained to use bombs though not every witcher uses them but we see this again witcher three wild hunt where mm -hmm. you get bomb access 
blade oils and poisons, mm-hmm. uh, which, you know, that some creatures are more weak to certain things. Uh, some witchers make use of one handed crossbows. And this was something that was only added in The Witcher 3. The Witcher 1 and 2 did not have them. And some of the community was actually very uh, against the idea that Geralt was now using a one handed crossbow. That was one of the things that they were like, eh, that's not, that doesn't sound right. If I remember correctly, they, uh, whenever I was looking this up, they specifically talked about, I believe it was the school of the Griffin. Oh, sorry. Several witchers from different schools utilized one-handed crossbows. However, it was not very common. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I assume this is more for like flying or, you know, more, I guess, mobile creatures that yeah. cause you can't really f- fight a Griffin from the ground unless it lands. You gotta, gotta get it to land somehow. Right. Witchers are master trackers. So they, they train from their youth cause you don't need, you know, anything super to like learn how to track something. And then once you get your like enhanced senses and stuff, it just becomes easier. Right. Right. But even without those enhanced senses, they would still be very, very good at it. Better than most humans. Witcher signs, a uh, limited form of magic often thought of as mere tricks compared to the potential of most sorcerers and sorceresses. Right. We've talked it's about still that as well. Yeah. Useful and versatile. Right. Now there's one other item that shows up in uh, very commonly in the games. In fact, there, there's the close to uh, uh, there's the meme of when you find a place of power. And this this gets every so often these pop up again. And, uh, you know, and, and Geralt's quote of like uh, medallions, uh, medallions vibrator or whatever he says must be a place of power. <laughs> Right. Yes. So that that is that is the final tool here. Witcher medallions that vibrate in response to magic in all its forms, including curses, charms, and spells. They also warn of lurking monsters born of magic or magic experimentation. Can be fooled by certain monsters such as Dopplers and higher vampires who can remain undetected in the range of the medallion. Yeah, and there's some good stories about Dopplers and uh, vampires. And this is sure. probably one of the the main, I guess, examples here was was Regis. Whenever Geralt first encounters Regis, he's uh, not really certain about Regis's true nature because he, he's, as we know, he's a, a higher vampire who can really just like circumvent the medallion's uh, mm-hmm. magic senses. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that it looks like we've sum up. Um, most of the details about creating a witcher and the fundamental qualities of the witchers what comes next toasty where are we going next time so uh, i kind of want to talk about the different witcher schools um and delve in a little bit to their specifics um and i i think i want to talk about i mean monster slayer comes out wednesday i, I think yeah. we gotta talk about our first impressions i mean we're gonna have what five days to play it and and you know tell people what uh what our first thoughts are and and what we think of it yeah yeah that sounds good to me um i, I you know the witcher schools are very cool I, I i hope we get to see some of that in the tv series um because and i hope they do it well i hope it's not just like a uh he's from a different witcher school but you know like i hope it's actually like interesting characters from other witcher schools that show up unexpectedly sometimes and, and that kind of stuff and who knows you know i think we'll have a very focused season for season two but you know in future episodes f- future seasons and the other show as well especially the other show as well and maybe even in the the um the anime that's coming out in a few weeks like maybe we'll see some of that stuff too i think i think for the anime we're probably going to get a mostly school of the wolf mm-hmm. I mean, as the title suggests, Nightmare of the Wolf kind of. Specific. Yeah, but that doesn't mean that like other other schools don't show up, you know, like that could be very, very much a thing. Um, so that would be cool, too. Uh, yeah, there's an anime coming on uh, Netflix. So uh, go back and listen to it, the previous episode because we dissected WitcherCon and all of these big announcements coming out. So if you go listen back to that episode, you'll hear all the little details about all the goodies. So awesome. Tosi, this has been a, a really cool episode. And do you have anything else to share before we head out? Um, just the usual things, uh, 
follow us on Twitter, Witcher Lorecast. Uh, you can follow me personally at uh, so fan of toasted on Twitter, all caps. <laughs> yep, yep. Very much all caps. <laughs> Very much all caps. So yes. fan of toasted. Yes. Cool stuff. Yeah, you can follow me at robots underscore radio, and of course the Witcher Lorecast uh, Twitter, and join us on Discord. I I mean it when I say I want to hear some of your impressions of the new mobile game when it comes out. We will definitely have some time before the next episode because we record on Mondays, like I said. And come join us live on the stream. I'd love to have you guys chiming in as you've have you as you've heard on this episode. I've been responding to some of the comments and chat as we go through, and I'd love to have some more of that conversation going on live, and then also on the Discord later to talk about some of the cool stuff that we've been doing in the witcher games or especially when the new season of the show comes out some of our thoughts on on that stuff as well so come join us for that and i will be back in about 30 minutes with the xbox game pass show we're talking about some of the new games and some of the things we've played on the xbox game pass so stay tuned for that and um i'm going to leave the stream up play some music for you guys and be back in just a little bit so uh thanks for joining us everyone toasty it's been good hanging out with you. I'll see you again soon. And we'll see you next week. All right, everybody. See you later. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to the Witcher Lorecast. We'd love to hear about your experiences with the games and the books and the TV series and all your thoughts on everything. Please check out the Robots Radio Discord and follow us on Twitter at Witcher Lorecast. You've been listening to a Robots Radio podcast. Smart shows for interesting people. Check out all the shows at robotsradio.net.